submit your questions to us. Uh, we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, and in fact, I'd like to cover one now. Uh, and I'll ask this of both of you. How do you decide which materials and reagents would be categorized as raw materials? And do you make a distinction between raw materials and critical raw materials? Either, Joe, do you, either one of you? Sure, I mean, that's, I, I think that that's work between looking at guidances, working with your regulatory and quality team to figure out which pieces uh, fall into what category given the guidance and given to how it is specific to your process as, as well. I think that if you put the work in to show what is critical and what is, I guess, just a regular raw, um, you have to justify. You know, we were talking about working with the, the agencies and, and, and with the regulatory bodies and you have to put in the work. It's a collaborative effort to ask the right questions and, and, and to show the data, but ultimately you have to come with a data package and the process understanding of being able to justify what you're calling something, whether or not you're justifying what a reagent is, how it's considered, or whether or not you're putting the specs uh, for a release test. It's about having the data that shows that this is why uh, we're making this decision. And, and I think if you can back that up and have had collaborative conversations with the agencies that you'll uh, find a way to have specs that are appropriate and raw materials bucketed in the right class. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. and at least I would also echo like uh, that in, in the sense of, um, you know, as you establish these, these partnerships with these suppliers and understand kind of their ability to be consistent in their delivery materials, right? Uh, I think between the impacts of your process plus the consistency of the vendors, you know, you put these two things together and I think that uh, kind of allows you to set the criticality of the material. Um, you know, you, of course you always start from a conservative side, everything I would say should be determined critical, deemed critical until proven otherwise. Um, and again, the data will tell you what that is, right? And your process understanding uh, will tell you when you, when you can downgrade from critical to, to maybe you know just a, a raw material, but it, but it's going to take some time and it's going to take a lot of kind of experience understanding not only your process but the impact of the materials on your process. Good. Okay. Um, I want to get to one another audience question, uh, and Joe, this one is specifically for you. Um, apart from plasma DNA, have you tried? other forms of DNA synthesis and methods and platforms which you can which can provide linear DNA and how would you define good DNA raw material from a quality quantity and properties perspective um, yes I have tried uh, other methods of DNA synthesis or using other plasmids that come from methods of other types of DNA synthesis than just cell based um, and uh, yeah, there are more, I think there's more options out there now. Uh, the tried and true cell-based method is, uh, or the, the typical vendors that have been in the space for a while are, I think, um, very very suitable and, and, and they, they understand uh, how to make plasmids for these cell and gene therapy species. Um, regarding how do I define good DNA as a raw material? Uh, I guess I define it again by the understanding of the process of my own uh, mRNA process and understanding the implications of what happens when the parameters around the DNA changes. Uh, I mean, there are obviously good DNA has the sequence that has the specific sequence that's needed. I mean, I know that everyone knows that a, a tail is typically needed uh, for a RNA molecule. Um, so in that sense, having all the elements that are needed for a, a functioning RNA, uh, as well as other, um, as well as other, I, I, you know, there's residual proteins that are in uh, the plasmid. There, there's there's residual uh, DNA that's in plasmid. There, there's a lot of other impurities that are in the plasmid. But for me to define uh, good, that's in the the context of 
what we're using it for and how it, uh, it how it works in, in our process. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to define what good looks like. It, it, good is defined by uh, you using it in the process, understanding what happens when you change the, the input variable. Um, so uh, good, I mean, in general, is the sequence is what it says it is. The material is full length. Uh, it has certain elements that are needed. And then trusting the assays to uh, tell you that those characteristics of the molecule are, in fact, uh, there and in the quantity or in the abundance that you think they're there. Thanks, Joe. Um, another uh, audience question we have here, that's a pretty good one. Are these therapies shifting from current by specifics? And how long will it take to, to shift to cell and gene? That's open to either one of you, whoever would like to take a crack at it. Uh, I mean, is that asking how long it takes to import a program from one to another, from one modality to another? I think that that's what that's suggesting. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, at the heart of it, that's asking how long you can get a sequence and go to RNA. Uh, we've seen that in the vaccine space. I think it's can be much more challenging for other indications. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, movement in this modality to get into other spaces outside the vaccine. It's hard to say how long those will take because the science, it's up to how much, the, you know, how much effort's going into understanding the disease and the way that RNA can treat it. Um, in general, I, I, I think that programming, we've seen programs go in less than a year, uh, but again, that's for vaccines. So if there's some complex biology, I would imagine it could go faster because the cell-free mechanisms, except for the plasmid, can facilitate shorter manufacturing times. But I don't know how long it's gonna take to port things from bispecifics into the cell and gene space that, you know, it, it can take under a year. It can, take up to two or three years, I think, uh, with a decent amount of effort and a, a you know, positive you know, scientific readouts that it's a drug that could progress through research and development. It's a hard question. I, it, it's up to the amount of programs that are in the company and the amount of effort that's put in, into that space. Sure, thank you for that thoughtful answer. Um, before we move on, I do, well, as we're kind of wrapping up here, especially with our audience questions, I would like to hear from both of you in the next handful of years, you know, one, two, five years tops, in a perfect world, what is, what's to come in mRNA therapeutics uh, supply chain perspective, if you had it your way, what would you love to see come down the pike to really optimize production and a, a better, more efficient supply chain. Uh, so I guess I can jump in first. Uh, what, what has come down the pipeline to optimize supply chain? I, I think for us, uh, at least for me, I would answer the question with, um, All right, that's a challenging one. Uh, I would say maybe like, you know, a commitment. I, I think a commitment, but not from, uh, like, the, the companies are there. I, I think the kind of the financial situation uh, around funding MRA companies, right, has it, been challenging. Um, so, you know, I think the technology is there. The, you know, the knowledge is growing, you know, internally as well as across the industry. Um, so just hopefully ensuring that, you know, there's enough funding and backing to, to allow the companies to reach that end goal. Um, I, I think that's a critical one. I think personal, personalized cancer vaccine, that said, you know, we're very excited about that space. Um, but, you know, the quantities, the quantities here are going to be challenging since they're so small. You know, you, you can typically support a patient with something like 250, 300 mates a year, right? Um, and, and then as you're running, you know, hopefully, 
in terms of those contracts for a lot of patients, right, it's going to be uh, sourcing all these small quantities. So that, that it's going to be challenging. But uh, so, so really, I think if, you know, PCVs take off, that, you know, suppliers are thinking about that as well and finding kind of solutions to support that small-scale production um, in a way that, that small companies can, can financially benefit from as well. Um, as I mentioned, like sourcing GMP plasma is very expensive right now. Uh, you know, those are at least the options we've been able to find. Um, very expensive. So, um, so much so that sometimes it, it, it can even be a stopping point, right? But, you know, I'm sure as, as companies are coming out with different solutions, that, that, you know, they're thinking about that as well, and they're going to be able to partner with manufacturers to, to support this small scale for the PCB market. I think that would be my response. Fair. Okay, thanks. Uh, and Joe, I want to give you the opportunity to respond as well. Um, you know, perfect world. Sure. Could, could, years could, you that? That. could you repeat yeah. that, Aaron? I, I, uh, I'd like to hear uh, that again. Too. Absolutely. Just wanted to know from your perspective, you know, if you had, in a perfect world, what does the next handful of years look like for the mRNA therapeutic supply chain in a best case scenario what do you think would it, what would you have it look like? Best case scenario, I think uh, the, maybe the, the prices maybe come down a little bit uh, for some of the, uh, some of the raw materials. Um, but again, you know, they have gotten better. And so I think that the trajectory for, for prices and options of, of high quality materials um, hopefully that, you know, as, as the, the space takes off and more players become established that, that there's some competitive pricing there. Uh, I, I do think, um, that also, you know, it, perfect world, some of these CDMOs, uh, the contract manufacturers, um, would show with some of the smaller players that are coming up now, um, those would, would show some, uh, some value and, and be able to uh, kind of mature in the space and and really help to um, alleviate the 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 queue that is getting in line for I guess plasmids or mRNA space uh, or even drug substance I mean drug product formulation space for LMPs. Um, there's filling, lots of things need to be filled as well. Fill lines um, are also something that that. Are, have long lead times. People don't often think about what happens from the bulk to the fill, but um, you know, maybe maybe increasing the capacity there. Um, I just really think in the next couple of, of years, as I said at the uh, the top of this, that there is a good foundation in place, and I, I think the best case scenario would be to see that foundation mature and take off and have the the up and coming players, I guess, more established in the next three to five years so that the uh, the biotechs that are starting up then can have other options and there's a more of a well-worn path about how to how to navigate this space to get into uh, the clinic and, and further into commercialization of the drug problem. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate your responses to that. All right, that concludes our presentation, and I want to thank Joseph Barbario and Christian Moreno for their time and insight, and thank you to Roche Custom Biotech for partnering with us. We look forward to connecting with you in our next Cell and Gene Live, which is scheduled for October 29th, that will focus on genome editing, and we'll see you then.